So in this tutorial, we're going to look at the Earth and its structure and plate tectonics, in other words, plate movement. First, we're going to describe the structure of our Earth, then explain the cause of plate tectonics moving plates, and explain the evidence for continental drift, the idea that the continents are moving apart from each other. We live on a thin layer of the Earth known as the crust, and the crust is cracked and divided into giant moving plates. But what's more interesting is the fact that we actually don't know a great deal about what's going on under our very own feet. In fact, it could be argued we know more about what's happening up in space than what's happening directly about 60 kilometers below our feet. And the reason for this is whenever we try and send machinery down there, the intense heat and pressure just destroys the machinery. So it's very hard to collect data on our Earth's structure. But that's not to say we're clueless. We certainly have a good starting point. So here is our blue planet, the planet Earth, and the Earth has a diameter of around 12,000 kilometers. From space, we can only see the crust of our Earth, and some of the crust is buried underneath oceans. The crust itself is fractured. It's very thin layer, only varying between 5 kilometers to about 50 kilometers deep, depending on whether you're standing in a valley or on top of a mountain. The fractured crust is divided into large moving masses of rock we call plates. These plates float upon uh, the mantle. The mantle is a very slowly moving solid underneath. A bit like crackers resting on hot treacle. Now we know these plates move and the evidence from this largely comes from earthquakes and volcanoes. Wherever earthquakes are frequent you can expect you live somewhere on a plate boundary. This also explains why certain regions you don't really get many earthquakes. For example on our country in the UK we really don't get earthquakes or none to worry about anyway. So earthquakes and volcanoes are found on plate boundaries. But for us to understand that the Earth is not a static system, it's always in a state of change, we need to look inside the Earth. So we need to take a cross section through the Earth. Once we do that, we can see that the Earth is made from distinct layers. The innermost layer is referred to as the inner core. Due to the extreme pressure it's under, it acts like a solid. And just outside that, we have the outer core, which is under less pressure, so acts more like a liquid. The inner core and outer core are made from iron and nickel, two magnetic metals, which is why our Earth has a magnetic field around it. Then, most of the Earth's structure is composed of the mantle. The mantle acts like a very slowly moving solid. The heat from the mantle is generated through the process of radioactive decay as unstable elements decompose under the Earth's crust. The thin outer layer is known as the crust. This is where we live. So now you can describe the structure of our Earth. But as I said, the Earth's crust is fractured. It's split up, divided into giant moving plates. And these plates, as I said, can move. But what causes them to move? We get rotating currents of heat, known as convection currents, which move the masses of rock that rest upon the mantle. These convection currents are responsible for moving the plates and driving the rock cycle. And knowing that convection currents drive the rock cycle will really help you in exams because it comes up a lot. So just a quick summary of the key facts. The crust is 5 to 50 kilometers deep and it's the outer layer of the Earth. The mantle acts as a slowly moving solid. Radioactive decay keeps it hot. There are convection currents in the mantle that move the plates. The core is hottest, the outer part is referred to as liquid, and the inner a solid. The core is iron and nickel, which makes it magnetic, and therefore gives the Earth a magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field protects us from harmful solar radiation. You may have heard of a phenomenon known as the Northern Lights. This is when solar radiation is basically interacting where the field lines are weakest at the North and South Pole. This means the radiation can enter closer to our Earth's surface. When this happens, we see this fantastic display of changing colour. But you have to be pretty far north to see this display. Commonly referred to as the Northern Lights, but also known as the Aurora Borealis. Earthquakes are a direct consequence of moving plates. So you can imagine two giant land masses or two plates come close to each other and get stuck due to friction. Over time, the convection currents are moving them in opposite directions, but they can't move because they're stuck. Then suddenly, they slip. And that's what causes an earthquake. Scientists never know exactly how much force is required to create the slip. 
so we never know how long before an earthquake occurs. We can look at rocks in our earth and see if they're under a particular strain which might indicate an earthquake, but generally speaking, it's pretty much impossible to predict accurately when an earthquake happens. Volcanic eruptions are truly scary things, and you may remember the most famous case, which is in Italy, Pompeii, when an eruption occurred, and the pyroclastic flow, in other words, all the ash, hot ash and debris that flew out, trapped many citizens of Pompeii, preserving them as they were at that moment in time. Quite a haunting thought. Volcanic eruptions are slightly easier to predict. See, magma moves slowly and can slowly rise towards the Earth's surface, causing it to bulge. These bulges can indicate that a volcanic eruption is on its way. However, sometimes the magma just cools and forms rock, and so it's a false alarm. So again, volcanic eruptions are not easy to predict. So now you can explain that convection currents are the cause of plate movement, plate tectonics. The rock cycle occurs very slowly, and therefore it's difficult to observe, and even more difficult to convince people that it's happening. That honour goes to the scientist Alfred Wegener, who came up with a theory of continental drift, that stating that the continents are moving or drifting apart from each other. This was devised in 1915. But before then, scientists had some odd explanations for why there are mountains and valleys on our Earth. The first logical idea that scientists came up with is our Earth was very hot when it first formed, and as it cooled, the Earth's skin or crust contracted and the skin crumpled up to form the valleys and mountains. A bit like the skin on an old apple. Wegener's idea was that the Earth's landmass started off as one supercontinent called Pangaea, where all the continents were basically centralised, all started off together. And he proposed that over time, they drifted apart. The evidence supporting continental drift comes from the idea, firstly, that the land masses that make up the continents fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. The only reason they're not a perfect fit is because over time natural erosion has changed the landscape. But hopefully it won't take too much convincing to tell you that this area here could slot in quite nicely to this shape here. It's a complementary shape. It was also observed that there are matching fossil types and rock types on the west coast of Africa and the east coast of South America. Now you have to ask yourself what's more likely, that the same animals evolved independently on two different continents, or the continents were once together where the animals evolved and then they separated and got fossilised. These observations certainly piqued scientists' interest, but these observations did not explain how these features occurred or why earthquakes were happening. Scientists were sceptical of what Wegener proposed. This was partly exacerbated, made worse by the fact that he wasn't actually a geologist, he was an astronomer. So some snooty scientists believe he had no right delving into the world of rocks. Wegener's explanations for continental drift weren't foolproof either. One suggestion was that the plates were moved by tidal forces, like a giant rock surfboard on a wave. He also thought that perhaps the Earth's natural rotation was responsible for moving the plates. However, both these ideas were disregarded by scientists, and they were incorrect. In the 1950s, the missing piece of evidence was discovered, and that came in the form of seafloor spreading. Basically, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, in between the USA and the UK, you can find a network or a chain of deep-sea underground volcanoes. Now, to understand this piece of evidence, first you have to understand that the Earth has a magnetic field with a North Pole and a South Pole. What you also need to understand is over time, this magnetic field switches, it reverses, so the north becomes the south and the south becomes the north. Whether this happens instantaneously or it collapses and reforms or rotates is unclear at the moment. But we certainly know this is true, that the magnetic field reverses due to evidence in rocks. So this is where the volcanoes are found in between the two plates. And over time, the plates move apart. So we are, in fact, moving away from America at a rate of about an inch a year. As the plates move apart, magma basically rises to fill in the gaps. So inside the magma, you have magnetic particles which will align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. So if the magnetic field is north at one point in time, then all the particles will face north. So if the Earth's magnetic north is facing this way, then all the magnetic particles, as they cool and solidify, they will be preserved in the same direction. 
then convection currents continue to move the plates apart. Magma once again rises to fill the gap, but this time the Earth's magnetic north is facing downwards, so the magnetic particles in the rock will reflect this and face downwards, and the process keeps on going. This magnetic striping is strong evidence that the continents are moving further away from each other, and that continental drift is in fact true. So now you can explain the evidence for continental drift.